Hey Radio Rothbard fans, the Mises Institute has a new free book for you, Dr. Guido Holzman's How Inflation Destroys Civilization. Learn how inflation isn't only making us poorer, it's harming our culture, mental well-being, and the moral foundations of civilization itself. Get your free copy today at Mises.org slash RothPodFree. Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor with the Mises Institute. And with me, of course, is my co-host, Tho Bishop. And uh, we're very fortunate today to have with us Guido Hulsman. And he's one of our senior fellows. If you follow the Mises Institute at all, you're quite familiar with him. He's a professor at the University of Angers in France and, uh, of course, has helped form many of our PhDs uh, who are associated now with the Mises Institute. And he has a new book out that uh, I want to talk about a little bit today. The book is called Abundance, Generosity, and the State, An Inquiry into Economic Principles. Now, this is an important book. Um, It covers topics that are generally ignored in the field of economics. And if you went through an economics program like I did, and if if you ever tell people, like I used to have a, a job where my job title was economist, and you tell people that's what you do, or tell them now, oh, I edit an economics publication. They, they always go back to this idea of homo economicus and what they learned in school. If they took one or two economics classes in school, it's all this idea about rational behavior, neoclassical stuff. And it never really touches upon what these people know is very fundamental to the human experience, which are these issues around non-monetary exchanges where people – They engage in behavior that doesn't have to do with getting an amount of money back in return for performing this deed or act or selling this service. There's there's this whole economy out there of, as you say, abundance and generosity. And you, with this book, which is a substantial book, attempt to really raise some of these issues about how do we understand this, this aspect of the economy. And I'm just really interested in this topic overall. And I've just written some short articles in the past, right, with titles like the, the homo economicus myth and things like that. And we do find, right, in the, if you delve into Austrian economics, people like Mises, right, they, they weren't like the stereotypical neoclassical uh, caricature of, of economics like people who – took one or two economic classes believe in, and he had a much more sophisticated view. And it seems to me that you're building something uh, substantial based on that good foundation. And so I, I want to ask you a little bit just kind of your own assessment really on what is the state of the discipline on this issue of charity, abundance, uh, and what what prompted you then to launch your own investigation into into these phenomena? Well, that, that's a, is, is a very good question. Uh, well, charity and abundance are treated separately from standard economics. So, if we look at the training of of young economists, such as yourself, more recently, and myself at, at the time, and everybody uh, today, uh, in the classes on microeconomics and, and macroeconomics, you never talk about these things and so on. So these are specialized uh, classes that you typically have on the master level. You get uh, specializations, whatever, in the uh, economics of charity or the economics of nonprofits and uh, something like this. Really specialized uh, courses. It's completely separate from the rest. And what they do there is is, is indeed very often to to, um, distance themselves from the, the, the standard approach in economics, which relies in, in neoclassical economics very strongly on the homo economicus uh, hypothesis. So the homo economicus is, uh, is a being that tries to maximize uh, monetary profit. Right? So not necessarily monetary revenue, but the difference between uh, revenue and cost uh, over time. So homo economicus, in whatever he does, uh, has this uh, uh, money measuring rod before his eyes, and that's what he tries to uh, to maximize. Now this uh, th- uh, is obviously a fiction because human beings do not act like that. So it's it's very easy if you want to 
present your own study program or your own uh, course on the economics of gifts or of the philanthropy or, or whatever uh, by, by pointing out, well, the homo economicus does not correspond to what we observe in the real world because people are very often not interested in money, and fortunately so. It would make family life very uh, stressful if, if this was the, the only topic of conversation and the only orientation. Uh, friendship would be virtually impossible right? if, if this was uh, the only thing that counted. So uh, obviously it's not the case. Right? So, so then why um, has this become so important in, in, in mainstream neoclassical economics? And the reason uh, has much to do, I think, with um, the attempt to introduce mathematical modeling uh, into economics. It's something that rose slowly uh, in the course of the 19th century and then uh, grew very strongly after the publication of Leon Varas's and uh, Stanley Jevons's uh, books in, in, in marginalized uh, economics or so, um, uh, elements of, of pure economics from Varas and theory of political economy from um, uh, Stanley Jevons in the early 1870s. Um, now, they did something that the classical economists had not cared for, namely the, the introduction of uh, mathematical modeling of human behavior. So this was supposed to be uh, uh, the next great step in, in improving the quality of the science, right? The modeling it after the, the, the natural sciences. So how do you model uh, human behavior that is obviously uh, apparently uh, chaotic, may have different orientations and, and so on? Um, it can be greatly facilitated by introducing the hypothesis that we are dealing only with human beings that are homi homines economici. All right, so we'll just try to maximize value. And that brings about um, one of the, um, uh, uh, the, the results that are, are crucial uh, to do neoclassical economics, main, namely the model of the perfectly competitive market. In the perfectly competitive market, uh, you have an equality of uh, revenue and cost for all businesses. And not only revenue and costs are equal, but uh, marginal uh, cost and average cost are also equal in the perfectly equilibrium uh, situation. So all, and that means, I mean, uh, let me translate this. What, what this means is that uh, whatever service you provide to somebody else, it is exactly retributed with an exact uh, corresponding equal value. Right? You receive a, a, a good or a service for somebody, well, you pay an equivalent uh, value to that person. That's the significance of the perfectly uh, equilibrium, uh, perfect, pure and perfect competition. Right? And so the homo economicus was, in fact, a tool to get to this point. How can we explain that there's a tendency to what such a, such a situation? Why is this situation important? Well, because it was supposed to epitomize uh, the very meaning of justice. Right. The idea was that in a perfectly competitive market, well, not only you get economic uh, efficiency, but this economic efficiency is also morally just and good. Right. So that was the idea behind uh, uh, Varaz. And then Varaz uh, uh, and, and others, of course, they say, well, uh, this is a, a theoretical construct because in order to get this point, not only uh, does human, do human beings have to be um, homines uh, economici, but they also need to be omniscient. Sort of right, so they need to know exactly what has happened or what the situation currently is. Uh, what are the different quantities and qualities of goods that exist, and but also they need to be able to foresee what's going to happen in the future. Only then do you get to such a situation in which you have uh, a pure and perfect uh, uh, equilibrium. And um, so that that was uh, uh, obviously not always the case. So then you get deviations, and this opened opportunities for government intervention. Right? So if we deviate from this general equilibrium situation, well, then at least we have an idea. We know where we should be. Right? And so we can say, yes, um, um, people are imperfectly informed about uh, the, the existing uh, conditions. So maybe the government should stop, step in and provide information about economic uh, uh, conditions. Uh, maybe the government should uh, in, uh, intervene in the economy in order to prevent that monopolistically large uh, corporations uh, emerge or uh, labor unions grow too uh, to, to powerful. Uh, and so that rather than have a competitive situation, we have monopoly and so on. Right? So it, it's, it's, it's a mixed Back, but the the idea is really it, it comes from the idea of um, uh, uh, creating uh, a model of the economy that is perfectly efficient and perfectly just. In order to get there, you needed the homo economicus uh, hypothesis, and that of course 
right? You, you're, you're, you're on the wrong track from the outset because you're, in fact, what you're doing is not to engage in a scientific um, endeavor. In science, we're trying to describe reality as it is, to explain the causes and the consequences that follow from it, but you're erecting a straw man, right, which is your model, and then you're pretending that somehow this is supposed to represent an ideal in comparison to which you can measure the real world. Right? So economics has been on a wrong track uh, ever since those days. And one of the victims uh, is not the only one, but one of the victims was the economics of uh, gratuitous goods, so donations, uh, externalities, and so on, which from then on have been separated uh, the, uh, in a very artificial way from the main corpus of economics. And what I do in my book uh, v very much is really to bring this all back into one um, uh, edifice and show that, well, building on Ludwig von Mises in particular, uh, but also other uh, very good economists such as uh, Frederick Bastiat uh, and, and Kenneth Boulding, uh, uh, more recently was a non-Austrian, um, well, we can show that uh, really uh, reality is one, right? And also our theoretical explanation of both markets and uh, uh, non-market behavior, gratuitous goods and so on, can be articulated under a unified and coherent uh, theoretical edifice. And that's what I do in the book. And then try to, um, um, to help our, our listeners um, understand why, why I'm so excited about this project and I think the timing of it is, is so great is that you, know, you mentioned how some of these misconceptions um, have political ramifications in terms of some of the conclusions that might be drawn there. But you know, we're at a time right now where kind of the discipline of economics, and, and perhaps for good reason, given the fallacies of the mainstream, is under attack, not only from the left that has always had a kind of hostility to markets, but also from the, the right that have criticized economics for being so focused on kind of purely materialistic ends, um, you know, that uh, some of it extends to some of their criticisms of libertarians as being, you know, hyper-rational or, or disconnected from uh, this seeking of, of a, you know, goodness and kind of a, a spiritual dynamic. And, you know, I, I think your book as, you know, really, you know, as, as a treatise, as a, as a foundation that can speak to, obviously, within your work broadly, you've, you've, you've addressed the, the cultural consequences of, of various economic phenomenon. Um, but I'm very excited for this to, to help younger scholars uh, help bridge that divide and help, I think, promote why the, the Misesian approach to economics is so important, so relevant, where so much of the conversation about economics broadly is so sterile in these areas and that we have something very rich to add to some of these cultural concerns that I think are, are very predominant in a lot of the political conversations throughout the West generally and particularly here in America right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, 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 thank you very much uh, for this comment. Yeah, indeed, this is uh, something that I had not really anticipated when I set out writing the book uh, because my, my focus was m more narrow. I mean, let me come briefly back on, on, on uh, uh, your question, Ryan, at the beginning. Was, uh, what was the motivation why they uh, started doing this? Well, um, I, I'm Catholic, and uh, uh, Pope uh, uh, Benedict the, the 16th in 2009, he had published this encyclical, Caritas in Veritate, uh, uh, Love and Truth, uh, Charity and Truth. Um, uh, in which he um, uh, discussed the central importance uh, in human life of the principle of gratuitousness. That's how I called it. And he says, well, the greatest goods that we possess, uh, love, uh, hope, uh, 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 truth, uh, and, and, and so on, right? they are not something that we create, that we deliberately choose, but they are given to us. So we don't produce them, we don't choose them, but they, we receive them. And all these things are received. Now, obviously, this also plays a role in the, the economy, uh, also uh, notably when we think of gifts. But uh, Benedict thought that it, it should play probably a, a bigger role, right? So it, it, it should just not be uh, limited or uh, 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 as in a closed box, right, put into this thing. Yeah, well, sometimes we do some charity, and the rest of the time we are just trying to maximize revenue. Um, so it, what are the ways in which this principle of gratuitousness in, in material activities can play a greater role and it should be a greater, a greater role? So he raised this question, right? So what's, what's the answer? Now, uh, um, in 2009, I, I was busy with uh, various other things. And uh, then I decided, okay, well, but this is a great topic. And I, I gave a talk on, on this or two. And um, uh, then I uh, set a, a doctoral student to work on this. 
right? So that was the easiest way for me to <laughs> kind of keep in touch with this and, and see a bit, okay, where this, is this going? What, what is the literature and, and so on? And the students I had, it uh, uh, was a very interesting uh, uh, case. Uh, 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 so we, of course, we were still friends. And uh, she, she's, a, in fact, she's a Catholic nun uh, from Africa. Okay. And, um, uh, well, so she applied and uh, said, well, I want, would like to do a doctorate with me. Uh, be, and she, she had been preparing uh, to do a doctorate in, in Germany. Uh, so, so she had studied German and so on, but, but in, in her native country, in Benin, they, they, they speak French. Right? So, but she had been prepared because she had received a, a, a scholarship from the Ratzinger Foundation. And uh, so I was supposed to find a German professor. Well, she did, but not in Germany. Right? And somebody pointed her attention to me and said, uh, well, this, this is a German professor, and, you know, but he is teaching in France. And so, so we got in, in, in touch. And, uh, I would have been reluctant to take somebody who had Marxist economics in her uh, cu curriculum. So, uh, in fact, her training was was not very good uh, preparation. But it was obvious that she was a smart person because she got a, a scholarship from the Ratzinger Foundation. They don't give them just away. And uh, she had uh, successfully uh, uh, gone through various other steps in her career. She had worked for the Ministry of the Economy and, and stuff like this. So she... She started working on, on, on the topic, and her English was not very good, so she, she was limited um, to talk about uh, uh, the French literature, the German literature, and then produced a very nice uh, dissertation of a couple of years later, so it was 2015. Now, clearly, this was a, the, the work of a beginner. Uh, it was worth a, a doctorate because nobody had really written on the economics of gratuitous, no? so it was the first work, so it was very justifiable to give a, a, a PhD. And, but it was clear to me that, well, there are uh, lots of uh, things that, that need to be taken care of, especially while well, she didn't, didn't, for example, I, uh, I did, did not have a good grasp of monetary economics, so she didn't see the ramifications on, on gratu uh, gratuitous goods and so on. So I said, well, yeah, so this might be a suitable uh, project for my own. And then it so happened that the, the following year, I was invited here at the Mises Institute to give a Lou Church uh, lecture, and I chose the topic of uh, gratuitous goods, or as the political economy of gratuitous goods. And in fact, what my book does is just to work out in much more detail the, the core ideas that I presented uh, in that lecture. Now, it was not so that I knew at the time everything that I would come to know eventually. Um, uh, but it, I mean, uh, th this, this was just a starting point. Right? And then two years later, I, I got a, um, a sabbatical semester. So I came to the US, and that's when I really started working on the book. And it took me four more years to, to finish. So it's been uh, quite a, uh, a project, right? And then, of course, you learn uh, various things that, that you didn't uh, uh, know or, uh, or even imagine uh, uh, at the beginning, right? And most notably, when it comes to um, uh, what I call in the book the side effect goods, right? In, in economics, we're, we're having the theory of market externalities, Right? So these are non-intended consequences that follow from, from a human action, and some of them have positive repercussions on other people. These are positive externalities. Some have negative repercussions, negative externalities. Now, in mainstream economics, uh, this is, uh, these externalities are problematic, right? Be precisely because they are not remunerated. Right? Keep in mind what I said before about the perfect, pure and perfect uh, equilibrium. In pure and perfect equilibrium, all goods that are provided to other people are remunerated, but also all uh, costs that you occasion to other people, they're also compensated. Right? So when, when we have uh, externalities, uh, clearly some benefits are non-compensated, and negative externalities, some uh, harm that you create, pollution or whatever, is, is non-retributed, uh, right? so not compensated. Um, so that, that's a big problem. Right? And uh, things uh, look very different from, from an Austrian perspective. This I knew, so this was a helpful starting point. Um, uh, because Mises had explained already in human action, and this was subsequently elaborated by other Austrians, such as Walter Block, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, Murray Rothbard, I also believe. And Mises had explained that there is a huge difference between um, negative externalities and positive externalities. Negative externalities are a metaphor for the courts. Right? If you create harm for other people in an unintended way, but demonstrable harm, right? and you don't have the right to do this, uh, then, uh, well, you sh uh, the others can either 
ask that you uh, stop this and, and they can enforce their claim in, a, in an economy, you know, in a society where the judicial apparatus is functioning with any modicum of efficiency, uh, or they can ask for co co compensation. Right. So, for example, let's say uh, you you are building your house uh, somewhere with, with no neighbors at all, right? And you're uh, you're playing music and and, and song of, of loud some loud activities, and somebody's moving there into the neighborhood. But uh, while well, you were there first, uh, well, then if they're moving there, well, they know that you make all this noise, and so they accept, in fact, that this is part of their environment. So they have no claim on you. But if you move somewhere else. And you start making noise where there was no noise before. Well, it's, it's a different scenario. Right? And uh, so this was explained very well by, by Mises and especially by Rothbard in, in, a, in a magnificent text on uh, the, the problems of air pollution uh, in the early 1980s. Right? So it's on the, on the Mises website. So, right? so from the, for, for the Austrians, negative externalities, yeah, they are a problem. But th that problem is likely to disappear as long as... Uh, uh, protection services or, or property rights are protected with any modicum of efficiency. On the other hand, uh, positive externalities are a completely different beast. Positive externalities are not wrong at all. Right? I mean, of course, you might try to, to get compensation for this, but if it's not possible under current conditions, technically you have no, let's say you're playing violin and other people, bystanders, they can, may enjoy uh, the, your, your melodies and, and so on. Uh, well, if there's no way for you to uh, make them pay for your performance, okay, so, so what? You, you're still playing for other reasons, because you enjoyed yourself or for your friends who are around you. Well, other people benefit from it as well, so, well, so be it. It's just how it is. And in fact, so for me, this is really nothing wrong with this. And this is absolutely crucial to understand one of the most important, most beneficial aspects of a free economy, namely that it's in fact full of such externalities or uh, positive externalities or side effects, right? So there is a sort of abundance of, of goods for which we don't pay, for which we benefit every day uh, in a free uh, society. So this one thing that I came to understand in the course of my studies that in fact, in a growing market economy, there is in fact the tendency that uh, the relative importance of such unpaid for goods increases relative to the uh, commercial uh, part of the uh, of the economy in which you strive for revenue and so on, right? So all uh, economic uh, goods, of course, increase in in, in volume, but the 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 non-paid uh, part, right, the gratuitous part, is likely to increase. And the other way around, if you have impoverishment, then of course uh, the, the 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 gratuitous part is likely to be hit harder than the uh, than the commercial aspect, right? So that's a very important point. Uh, to understand, right? And then when it comes to government intervention, uh, you can demonstrate, and that's what I try in any case in the book, and it's also something that I didn't anticipate at the beginning uh, when I started, but it is very clear that uh, precisely those uh, positive side effects, they are harmed by various government interventions. And uh, one uh, important example is um, uh, governments uh, uh, have in the past privatized to their own benefit various uh, goods that have existed previously only as a cultural common, that is something that results spontaneously from economic activity or from, from human activities, but without any deliberate creation. Uh, the most ex uh, ex important example that's always uh, discussed in the Austrian literature is uh, the monetary system. And if there's no government intervention, well, there would still be a monetary order, right? So people would use a generally accepted medium of exchange and it would be produced by certain people in various ways, uh, precious metals, uh, maybe Bitcoin, I don't know what, right? So, but people would use this and uh, everybody would benefit from it, but nobody would really own the, 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 that, that order, right? So it's a cultural common. Uh, same thing uh, uh, concerning the, the ju uh, judicial order, right? So in the absence of government interventions, well, there would be arbitration services, there would be lawyers, uh, there would be judges, uh, because it's necessary to settle conflicts as peacefully, as cost-efficiently as possible. So people would be doing this. And uh, such an order would exist um, without being owned by anybody. Right? And it would benefit everybody. So it's something as a, a spontaneous institution uh, in, uh, in Karl Menger's works, uh, words. Uh, now, what the government does is to privatize these things. Right? The government takes over and uh, uh, starts to own the order and creates, in fact, a system, a monetary system, a, judi a judicial uh, system. Right? And now the, the system is supposed to benefit 
the government in various ways. Right? And so what in fact happens here is the privatization of all the benefits, well, not all, but a, a, a more or less a large uh, part of, of the benefits that otherwise would spontaneously uh, uh, accrue to uh, uh, all the, the, the members of, of society. And, so, and, and you can show this for other side effect benefits as, as well. Well, we've certainly covered a number, I think, points that uh, that show that the mainstream, the neoclassical views and the models that are used are problematic in terms of, of enlightening us on these topics. What are some of the ways that the Austrian school is uniquely positioned to give you insights on this and, and providing a good foundation for our analysis of gratuitousness? Hmm. Well, uh, one um, uh, element is that while the Austrians have never sub subscribed to the Aristotelian equivalence postulate, uh, that's also the idea. So in Aristotle, well, I, I personally, well, I, mean, I say from the outset, right, I'm, I'm pretty Aristotelian in my whole approach, right? So for example, if you read chapter two of my book, I mean, this is Aristotle A to Z. Um, so I'm 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 a Aristotelian realist, right? Uh, I would say, um, uh, but Aristotle has bequeathed us one idea that is just wrong, and he doesn't really demonstrate the idea at all. He just um, brings it forth in the Nicomachean uh, Ethics, uh, in Book Five, in which he um, discusses the, the virtue of justice. And Aristotle claims that justice is characterized by uh, an exchange of equal values. Right? So whenever you give something and you receive something of equal value in return, that situation is, is just. Right? And the Austrians have never subscribed to this. Uh, this is really the, the founding of, uh, of, of the Mingarian theory of subjective value and of the following uh, theory of, of market par uh, prices, that uh, what, what people give in exchange has for them always a lower value than the thing that they receive. And there's nothing wrong with this, quite to the contrary, it's perfectly just, because all people agree. In fact, uh, when the, the two people, both of them benefit from this, right? It's not that one is ripped off at the, uh, uh, to the benefit of, of, of the other one. Uh, but uh, if one person gives an apple in exchange for an orange, right, then the, uh, the apple that he gives is for him of lower value than the orange that he receives. But the point is that for the other person who gives the orange and uh, receives the apple, it's the other way around. He prefers the apple to the orange, so he too benefits. Uh, that's in fact the little miracle at, at, at the center of, of market exchange. So it's not an exchange of equal values, but a double win. It's, so it's a win-win situation, right? You don't have to arrange this with uh, special policies or uh, uh, special laws or something like this. It's just uh, the, the condition under which any exchange takes place, otherwise nobody would do it. Right. And so the Austrians have never done this. And as a consequence, they didn't care uh, much about uh, uh, constructing um, a situation or explaining why the market tended toward a situation in which everything that was received was equally retributed by something of equal value. It was of no consequence to them. Right. And so what for the Austrians, what uh, always comes was not that situation in which cost is equal to revenue, but it's the process through which people interact. And it's true, right? If we think this process through, well, there is a tendency uh, to, uh, toward the disappearance of profits eventually, not toward a situation in which all revenue is equal to cost. That's uh, Austrians do not hold this, right? Uh, I mean, uh, not in the sense that marginal cost is equal to average cost. Austrians don't believe this, uh, but they believe that average cost is uh, is equal to uh, uh, the, the the average uh, revenue, which is, so is, is the market price. Um, uh, so that was of no consequence for them, right? And uh, so, therefore, my, my theory uh, was uh, not burdened from the outset with that objective, right? There was no point in demonstrating uh, that. The, a pure and perfect uh, competi uh, competitive situation result from the from the market process eventually. Um, an, another uh, uh, example uh, why Austrians are particularly suited is this: um, uh, the idea uh, that we also find in value theory, namely that uh, different goods um, uh, satisfy different needs that cannot be reduced to a common denominator. That is also very, very important. It's, it seems to be a technicality. And at the time I had studied this in, in the, when I was writing the Mises biography, I pointed out that in that respect, there's a big difference between Menger on the one hand 
and uh, Jevons and Valras, on the other hand, Jevons and Valras, uh, they said, well, all goods are, uh, have something, one thing in common, that is utility. So, in fact, what a, a maximizing agent does is to maximize the utility that he gets out of uh, different sorts of satisfaction. He can drink a cup of water, he can drink a cup of beer or whatever, uh, buy some shoes, uh, go on a vacation. And all these different satisfactions have one thing in common, namely utility. So what we're really maximizing is, because we can reduce them to a common denominator, we, can, we are maximizing uh, utility. Now, the, the problem with this conception, as I then discovered uh, in my book on gratuitous goods, is that um, uh, in, in that story, uh, the, the, the maximization concerns one single agent. Right? So there's really nothing uh, there. You, you place yourself from the outset into a solipsistic situation. There's only this one person that counts because it's all, really only his satisfaction or his utility and, and his choices that are part of the, uh, uh, the picture. Whereas in Menga, you have so well, these different goods cannot be reduced well, to a common denominator. They are heterogeneous. So what the agent does, in fact, is to uh, uh, make decisions that bring for them in their combination the best re overall re uh, result. Right? But the, the different objective that he pursues cannot be reconciled or cannot be reduced to a common denominator. So from that, that point of view, it becomes possible to, uh, to conceive, well, the, the satisfaction of the needs of others is one of our uh, objectives. Right? And it's not on the same level as the satisfactions they are meant for ourselves. So we can make this difference. Right? So from the Austrians, uh, I mean, we, we, uh, we, we can explain the behavior uh, of somebody who just thinks of himself, who is an egomaniac. Yes, with Austrian theory, you can explain that kind of behavior. But we can also explain why somebody would just care predominantly or partially uh, for others. And so he sets aside some of his time, some of, uh, some of his resources to ca cater to the needs of other people, all for a uh, deserving cause, right? He's pursuing justice for his own sake. He doesn't look at the bottom line uh, 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 for himself, but he says, well, I want to uh, pursue justice for justice sake, uh, and uh, I don't care what it, what it uh, costs uh, to me, right? He can, well, we cannot care at all. It's probably difficult, but he is willing to sacrifice a substantial amount of his time and of his resources in, in the pursuit of, the, of this goal. So from the Austrian, uh, uh, in, in the context of Austrian economics, it becomes possible, it's much richer, right? It's much richer in the, the, the possibilities to conceptualize, to understand uh, these different activities and distinguish them. Well, we've touched upon a little bit on where things went wrong in terms of, right, they've got these models and they want to quantify things. And I do think that that continues to be part of the issue just on a very fundamental level in the sense that when you start talking to people about, well, not everybody does things for monetary gain. And you say, well, they might just, they might just like giving gifts away. Uh, or they might, you see this all the time, right? Oh, I want my work-life balance. I prefer leisure to actually having money uh, for a variety of reasons. And there seems to be, when you, when, you, when you start talking to some people about this, there seems to be a resistance to, to really engaging that idea. And I think a lot of it comes down to, well, it just can't be measured. It's hard to measure. Well, uh, I prefer leisure. Well, why do you prefer leisure? I don't know. I like skiing. Well, how much do you like? How many utils does skiing give you? And it's very, you start getting into very uh, complex and non-precise measurements of things, right? And I had asked you in an earlier Q&A on this I said, because I was anticipating the question that people... Uh, would ask always the cynics or if you talk to a philosophy undergrad they'll always come back with well you know they're people they don't do anything really out of charity they they always think that there's always some hidden motivation they the cynic will tell us that well, they really are, are angling for some gain so I, I I asked you right do pure gifts really exist and and you came back and you said well actually it's really hard to know inside people's minds whether they intend to give a pure gift or not it's it's a measurable. So then I thought, well, maybe the real question is, do pure gifts really exist? And if we can't observe that, does it matter if pure gifts really 
exist? Do we need to concern ourselves with this issue of whether people are having pure motives in terms of their charity, or is that just irrelevant to our economic analysis? No, no, it's, 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 it's a good question, right? And in much of um, uh, economic research, uh, ba based on what you described, this, this this hypothesis that there's always some reciprocity that is that is being sought after, right? Or whatever we do. Um, has been underlying uh, economic research in the emergence of uh, institution and so on. And the, and the, uh, and the conclusion uh, of all of this research, theoretical research, but also empirical is, uh, well, actually, you cannot explain why uh, certain institutions exist, why people behave peacefully and, and, and stuff like that. So all you end up with is ultimately, well, well, people will always be trying to gain political power in order to, to enrich themselves. Right? And so, therefore, we need to have some deus ex machina, right? Some solution that comes from outside of the system and that creates a solution. And therefore, why, that's why, why people end up in saying, well, we need to have a state who creates uh, the judi judicial apparatus, who creates uh, whatever the monetary system uh, f for this all uh, to work out. Right? So, my answer is uh, that, yes, we, we can very well explain uh, that such uh, institutions like uh, the juridical order uh, the monetary order, without any government interventions, uh, evolve uh, if if there are people in, in in society that are willing to make the necessary sacrifices, and, and that's of course it's not an original uh, hypothesis or, or thesis or something. It's in fact what what most people have believed coming from philosophy and theology and so on. That in fact uh, society, human society, is built on on sacrifice. Ultimately, it's not built on the calculus of pleasure and pain. Uh, but on the willingness on the side of at least some people, and these are the leaders, to make the necessary sacrifices for the uh, sake of the greater good. And that's how uh, society, in fact, uh, thrives. It thrives at the expense of uh, sacrifice. It's a very, very powerful result. And of course, it's, it's in tune with what we believe as, as uh, Christians. Um, and, uh, and that's, I think, it goes a long way to explaining why uh, uh, modern uh, civilization uh, widespread uh, market exchange uh, among people who barely know each other and so on has emerged uh, in the, the Western Hemisphere. And of course, we do a lot currently to, to destroy all of this, so we'll see how far it goes. And uh, well, I shouldn't be surprised if we experience brutal and, and sudden, sudden collapses, right? Because if there's nobody there anymore uh, uh, who is willing to make sacrifices and he sees the beauty of it and is willing to forego benefits for himself so that other people, uh, his family, of course, in the first place, but other people at large, humanity, uh, thrive, um, well, then we won't go very, very far. Yeah, so it's, it's really interesting when you start to get into especially uh, ways of life that are not considered normal by the modern mind. Uh, for example, there's a there's an abbey a couple hours from my house. I go up there, a Benedictine abbey. I go up there every now and then for retreat purposes and that sort of thing. So there's these nuns that live yeah. there. And they come from the same background as me, some of them. They're similar age in many cases. They're from the suburbs. Uh, and at some point they decided, I want to live in this abbey for the rest of my life, right? <laughs> and I had a discussion with one of them talking about how even a regular practicing religious person like you or me, a lot of people, they don't understand why you would do these things on a daily basis or regular. What's the payoff, right? It's all the more bizarre to encounter one of these nuns who wears this habit and prays uh, multiple times per day and a formalistic psalmody and all of this stuff. I mean, how do you even begin to explain that yeah. stuff using neoclassical economics? Yeah, just, yeah. It's just totally out there. Yeah, it's, it's uh, folly, right? It's, it's the only explanation. Yeah? And what, what, well, what Christians have always held, and, and the great uh, Christian um, social philosophers of the Middle Ages and the present as well, I mean, uh, uh, all our civilization springs from, that, for, from such folly, right? Folly in the, in the eyes of humans. But in fact, you can demonstrate, yes, I mean, it's not something that is intended, because if it were intended, it would no longer be a sacrifice, right? It's not something that is the purpose. I mean, if the nuns consecrate their lives uh, to uh, a prayer and contemplation uh, of God and of creation, uh, it's not in order to save civilization. Right? That's not the objective. It's not a, a means to in order to attain that end, but it's still something that follows from it. 
Well, I mean, all I can do is recommend uh, to our listeners that they pick up a copy of the book. You can get it uh, soon. It's uh, not quite widely available, I don't believe, uh, but soon you should be able to get it on Amazon. It's, it's, it's already on Amazon. Is it on there yeah, now? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, then go ahead and... But the prices are lower on the Mises website, yes, as I noticed. I, I was going to say, you should definitely go to the Mises bookstore. Uh, and you can get a copy there, and this is uh, uh, certainly a brand new book, and yeah, I can't recommend it enough. And, and before we get out of here, um, obviously we're, we're here recording at AERC. Uh, we have a number of your students um, that are, are presenting papers, and obviously the, the Holzman branch of the Austrian school is, is thriving. Um, can, can you just talk for our listeners uh, where you see the, the current, um, you know, where, where, where is the Austrian tradition right now? What, what are some of the projects out there that you find um, particularly interesting, and, and what's your experience with the, the students that you have reaching out to you as, as you know, one of the preeminent um, mm-hmm. scholars out there with, with, with a number of PhDs? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, a lot of stress out there, and, and you know, politically and culturally and that sort of stuff. But it, it, there is a lot of, of hope, I think, within the talent and in the minds that are seeking yeah. answers in these times. Um, can you just talk a little bit about? Uh, uh, that perspective as uh, yeah well I mean so I must say, uh, thank you very much um, I, I uh, in my approach to to uh, doctoral training I, I don't re- have really an agenda I don't have a research program in which I want to integrate everybody uh, I want uh, to uh, every, uh, everybody to work on a subject that he really loves for which he is interested um, uh, and uh, just help them uh, in that in that re- uh, research and I think it's also uh, good to. Uh, for all of them that be, to become interested in the work of others, uh, so we were regularly meeting, and then we everybody's supposed to read the work always of of, of all the others and comment on the, on the work of all others because there's some 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 technical uh, aspects in conducting research that are the same whatever the topic you're working on, right? So uh, relating to methodology of of the critique and, and and so on. So they're working on very different uh, uh, topics. Last last fall, I had three guys who graduated. Um, uh, one, uh, two Americans, actually, uh, Jeffrey uh, Degner from Cornerstone University and Peter Earle from uh, the American Institute of Economic Research. Uh, uh, Degner, he was working on uh, the, uh, the family in the uh, inflation culture, and Degner was working on um, the accuracy of uh, uh, financial risk metrics. Okay, so very different uh, topics. Some some are related to, to finance and, and, and money and so on, but really uh, quite different things. So they've they've benefited uh, f- from the fact that others were working on something else, right? And so they c- c- were obliged to comment on this. Also, uh, very often you you get inspiration by uh, well uh, consecrating, giving right a part of your time to something that is not immediate of immediate concern uh, to yourself. The great Mises, he always said, well, uh, in his own readings, he uh, was very um, he had uh, very often a random selection of things they would read. I didn't have really a re- he didn't pack all the books related let's say to the theory of value on on the stack now I'm working through to the bottom so he, uh, right he was reading one or two books on this and then hopping off uh, to something else because uh, very often inspiration and and uh, fruitful hypothesis come from uh, reading something that is not directly related to this and so that's a bit the, the culture that I try to to cultivate in my uh, doctoral seminar let me just mention the the third uh, doctoral student who who, um, who graduated was uh, Philip Rice he's a Dutch uh, man he's also teaching at a small Christian college in uh, in the Netherlands and uh, so well I won't I won't mention the the new guys that are uh, coming up because I don't want to put any pressure on them because sometimes also people uh, it, it doesn't happen very often with me but sometimes people drop out because there are other things that become more important in their lives uh, or they, uh, they they just go f- frustrated. The, the sacrifice of time becomes too important because there is a lot of sacrifice that you need to make in order to produce anything of value in in research, right? So um, yeah, so that's 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 a bit my of my approach. Right? It's not really a, a program or s- uh, some some grand vision of um, uh, what are the th- uh, uh, topics that need to be addressed. I I don't look at current policies to, in order to to pick the suitable uh, topics, but. I, I do look at, at uh, great, uh, uh, great uh, problems, great transformations, and and so on, and then depending on the on the person that that is involved, well, some topics are suitable for this and that person. For example, Peter Early was working on the the accuracy of financial risks. He was the perfect person to do it because he had worked 20 years on Wall Street. He was very uh, good, uh, uh, quick on his feet in finan- in uh, quantitative methods, and so on. He was just a good person to to work on this. All right. Well, thank you, Professor Hulsman, for joining us today. We'll go ahead and wrap up with that for this episode of Radio Rothbard. 
Uh, thank you, Tho. And, uh, well, we'll be back next week with a new episode. So we'll see you next time. 